but uh, most people don't realize that this is a fallen planet. That means if you venture out on your own like a little child, the enemy is going to be there to try to misguide that. That's why the Bible says to raise up your child in the way that they should go. This is in Proverbs. And then when they get older, they won't depart from the standard that you put in their hearts. You see. And so the basic way is, not only do we have children and grandchildren, some of us great-grandchildren, wonderful, is we want to always take that we're representatives now of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, there's a difference, and I need to say this because God said to say this, so I will. He says there's a difference between knowing God and being religious. Okay? To, to have a religious relationship with God means you have a lot of head knowledge. Maybe you can quote scripture good. You know where things are at. You know what basically is right and wrong, but it's only in the head, folks. And as much as I want my head to be able to think correct, I need to take my head, my mind, just kind of having fun with you, stick it in the scripture so that I can begin to see the way things should be, the way things are, instead of the deception that you and I live in every day. Folks, there's a deception, a deceiver out there. And his job is to blanket the world and to keep humans away from knowing God. And that's why Jesus says, now you are saved through my word. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go let people know the good news. What would be the good news? Let me just share something with you. The good news was that God has set you free. Say amen. amen. Through Jesus Christ, your faith in Jesus Christ, God set you free. Now you might not feel free. You might still have some situations that you're working on. But in your spirit, you are free. Everyone say, I'm free. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But then Paul goes on to say, he says, now that Jesus made you free, that means you can make any choices that you want because you are free. You're not bound under obligation to have to make a choice because things are forcing you to. You're free to make your choice out of your own free will. Say amen, somebody. So let me say this a little bit of wisdom to you. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. You have all the freedom to do what you want. But not everything that you want has to be regulated. Hello? Now, for our sister who's new and a few that are new, you are a three-part person. Say three-part person. Look at your neighbor and say, you are a three-part person. You don't have to do it that way. You are. You are a spirit. You have a soul. And you live in a nurse suit, a body. It's a nurse suit. It's a machine that when God's original creation of the machine worked perfectly, had no flaws. But after Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it says that Satan's nature, which is S-I-N, sin, entered into Adam, into his flesh and spirit, and separated him from God. So what did God do? He says, all right, you've done it now. You created the unpardonable sin. Have you ever known your father to give up on you? Never. So God the Father approached in Jesus Christ, Adam and Eve, when they were hiding in the bushes and gave them a way to escape. God is always giving us a way to get out of here. Can you say amen? Everyone say, God always gives me a way to get out of here. Out of trouble. Out of problems, Jesus is the way. So when we follow Jesus and we walk with Jesus, he gives us the wisdom that we need that was robbed from us in Adam. The brain that we receive from Adam is very limited 
And some of us, more limited than others, the disciples of Jesus came to him early and said, this man over here that was born blind, who did sin that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, was it after, excuse me, I have one more piece part of that. Who did sin that this man was born blind? Was it his parents? Grandparents? Was it something he did that he was born blind? And Jesus says, none, neither. He says, he was born blind because of Adam's sin. People are born challenged because of sin that was passed on to us in our DNA in Adam. So, going back to the spirit, soul, and body. Your flesh, everyone look at it. That's not going. Aren't you glad? <laughs> now, here's the kicker. The Bible says that Jesus is coming after a church without spot or wrinkle. I answered this for you a long time. This is a beautiful thing. This is gospel. You'll never be without spot or wrinkle. But when Jesus comes with a shout, now listen, Amen. with the voice of the archangel, yes. with the trumpet of God, Hallelujah. we, which are mortal, will be changed. This yes. body will be swallowed up with a new one. Yes. It'll be exactly perfect of the one you lost in Adam. Amen. So guess what? Jesus is coming back. For a church without spot or wrinkle. Why? Because you're not taking your spots and wrinkles with you. <laughs> Don't look at me in that tone of voice. Now, I'm telling you biblical truth. I want you to go prove me wrong if you think you need to. But see, this is the gospel. This is the good news. God said, I am sorry that you were born in this fallen planet. I am sorry that Adam passed into your gene structure sin. But I have a place prepared for you. That where I am, you're going to go also. And the place that I go, I prepared. You will not take flaws, pain, sorrow. You will go glorious. Yes. Yes. So we need to start thinking about that. Instead of thinking about why certain things don't work right and why it doesn't go on that. You see, that's earthly plane. That's thinking on the earthly thing. And we've taught and shared and God has driven it in my heart that we keep our eyes off the world system. Keep our eyes off of others because we make mistakes. We saw, often say something that's wrong. We get offended. And third, our eyes off of ourselves. When we learn by God's power to do that very thing, you'll have the most gorgeous, stress-free life that you can have because you will be enveloped in God and his light. Now, what I just described for you is exactly what God wants for us. Exactly what Jesus prepared and accomplished for us. When he said on the cross, it is finished, he meant that. Satan doesn't want you to figure it out it is. He wants you to think that God left something out. And that's why you're going through some crud. Go ahead. You never know what God's going to do. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not yours to see. Unless you have the Lord. It's the truth. It's the truth. The gospel is so pure and so wonderful that you, which are broken, can be restored if you will take the time to be with God. Say amen. God is not going to leave you the way you are. He's too smart for that. But you can stay the way you are, but not praying. All right, let's move on. New creation realities. Everyone say amen. amen. All right. So we're going to call this, the subtitle of this, Bits of Wisdom in Prayer. Just bits of wisdom. There's a lot of different strategies and different things that we can do in prayer that are very wise, came from God, that we could help our prayer life. Can you say amen? And that's what I want to share with you today. Listen, I want to share these things with you. Okay, before I do, take your Bible and go with me to a very... Very familiar scripture, two of them. And then we're going to read our scripture up front. 
Matthew, you go to Matthew 6, verse 6. Put your finger there in your Bible. And they go to Psalms 91, verse 1, to kind of keep it right there. Because this is something I need to just always throw out. Folks, a lot of times in our Christianity, in our walk, we think we, we hear something, a truth, and we go, yeah. And then we hear another good truth, and we think, yeah. And then we hear another good truth, yeah. Wow, that's a really good God. You're putting it all together for me. But if we at any time follow just a truth, we're missing the truth. Hello? And so there are certain truths in your life that were working. Others you haven't got yet. That's why we seek him. That's why we go after him. Can you say amen? All right. And so sometimes we'll read a scripture over and over again. And you'll get something new out of it every time. But never say, I've heard this before. I know this. When you start doing that, you missed it. You're fleshing out. You're full of pride. And God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Rather, you should say, Lord, feed me more. Feed me more. You should be lying in the front pews. And it's good to see a lot of you people today. We've got a blizzard going and different things are going on out there. Amen. So this is Christmas. <laughs> Amen. Okay, you with me? So here's our scripture. One thing I have, I desire, I have desired of the Lord. Let this be our desire too, okay? That I will seek. It says, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, we see house and temple there. Right? That's Old Testament. They, when they want to gather, they would gather at the temple, the outer courts and all that, and come into the inner. It's the whole working of the, the Jewish nation. But in the New Testament, the house of the Lord is this living room right here. The house of the Lord is that church down the street that preaches Christ. Amen. So the house of the Lord is not you. It's the place where we meet. So the house, now listen, I got to explain this. The house of the Lord is just a building. But if the people keep meeting in the house of the Lord, God will sanctify that house. He will bless that house. He will anoint that house. And even the floors will tremble under the anointing. It's the consistency of the people meeting over and over and over again that builds the prayer and power battery in the church. So the house of the Lord is this building for us anyway. Okay? Many houses of the Lord. But there's only one church. Church, the church is different than the house of the Lord. Can you say amen? Now some of you just bear with me while I'm teaching somebody, okay? So the house of the Lord is just a place where we meet. So in the Old Testament, the temple, all that were places where they met with God. Say amen. Now what does he say? One thing I have desired of the Lord that will I seek that I may dwell in. So when you dwell in your house, what are you doing? You're hanging out. You're there. Can you say amen? So we can bring it now over into the New Testament. It's good to be in church. Hang out in the house of the Lord. Why? Because you all love Jesus. You all love God. You're good people. Amen. And God loves it because where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But folks, you are the church. That means that you are the called out one. It's the Greek word ecclesia. Everyone say ecclesia. So God called the Israelites out of the, the loins of Abraham. And then finally back out of Egypt. Can you say amen? So the Israelites came forth. We come forth. Okay. We are the church. We're called out. That's what it means. Called out once. Called out for what? To be separated from the world and to represent the Lord. How are people, now don't get mad at me. How are people going to find out the difference between a good godly man or woman of God and the world? They're going to have to see difference. Okay. 
And if our Christianity, we hide it and we don't share it, they'll never see anything. So here's what the devil did. He went into the churches and he started this movement. And I'm not against it, but I, I wonder about the motive. They call it secret churches. <coughs> what does that mean? It appeals to the, the worldly person. You have a rock concert for worship, lights and shows and everything. And some of these large churches are wonderful. Now, please, I'm not putting the church down. But Satan loves that. Because now he's moved the church instead of seeking God and being taught the word into entertainment. You go to church and you get entertained. I don't know about, some of those bands are just awesome. My favorite Christian band back in the day was Petra. They sang the word and they rocked around, you know. I loved it, you see. But going back to the church, okay, how's the world going to see the difference if we, at, we set the church up to be like the world? Well, we want to win people. You win them with the power, not with words of intellect or performances in front of them. You look at some of those preachers, they're performing and not preaching. They always have the same jokes. They always do the same wiggle. Hello. And when you see that, I'm not, again, people don't really, when I describe things, they, they, I'm, not, I'm not putting this down. I'm just telling you that Satan's a master at puppetry. Back in my day, you either knew the word or you just repeated it like a parrot. Huh? Polly want a cracker. You better believe in faith. That's a bad confession. And that's what happened. The real stuff moved on with God and the people that were just using and frazzling around, that's exactly what they did. And their lives began to fall apart. You might have had a friend, maybe somebody you know that their whole life fell apart because they weren't building on the rock. They were building on the entertainment and the fun stuff for God. Nothing wrong with enjoying the fun stuff for God, but not without you doing your homework, building on the rock. Say amen. All right, so let me just give you this in a nutshell, okay? Nutshell. When Jesus said it was finished, it is. So we need to think that way. You have the victory already handed to you in the form of Christ in your heart. But Satan will make you always think you have to get the victory. You have to do this. You have to get the victory. You have to believe in this. You have to manipulate your personality to make people like you. It's all a game. Haven't you figured that out by now? What you need to do, what we need to do, what I need to do is meet with God and let him bring out who I really am and enjoy the journey along the way. Say, oh me, somebody. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's go to Matthew. All right, and let's look at this. Oh, did I finish? No, I didn't finish, did I? Let's finish this, okay? Now, what part did I read? Okay, now, let's verse 5. For in the time of trouble, sounds like today, huh? He shall hide me in his pavilion. Another name for the building, okay? In the secret place. Everyone say secret place. Everyone say, I know what the secret place is. It's in the spirit. It's in the presence of God. Where's, where Satan can't go? He can't go in the spirit. He can't go into the presence of God. He can't follow you into your prayer closet. So he keeps you from praying. He doesn't want you to disappear in him. Yet the Bible says we're hidden in Christ in God. This is the good news of the gospel I've been trying to tell you. It isn't a work program. You don't have to work hard to get God to love you. You need to just open up and work hard to open up to the love God has given you. Woohoo! All right, now, let us not forget who we are in Christ. Like King David, 
as a shepherd boy, he came against Goliath, didn't he? With one smooth stone. And he said, I come to you with one smooth stone and in the name of Almighty God. And God took that stone and puppeted Goliath with it. Now, who's on your side? Who do you pray to? So, do you think your troubles are too much for him? What the problem is, if they're lingering on, is you're not praying enough. And I'm sorry to have to say that, but you need to break through in some of that so that God gets that area covered that's open. Amen. We're, we actually are in a war, but not for our soul. Our soul is already saved. We're in a war about our family, our children, our brothers, sisters, to gain them with Almighty God, to gain them in the Spirit by bringing God in on their lives. Prayer is getting you out of the way and bringing God in on the situation. Okay? Got it? So, where there's lack, bring God. You do that through prayer. In fact, the last message I sent out through the news feed talks about the sword of the spirit, a lightsaber that comes off of you. We'll talk about that some other time, maybe next week. All right, so let's look at this. So he flung the stone, but God directed the stone. Folks, we have a smooth stone. His name is Jesus. He's the rock. And when we speak his word, we're speaking the rock. We're flinging the smooth stones into darkness. And those smooth stones of the words of our mouth coming out of our physical spirit are full of light, power, and dominion. So when you learn to pray properly, you can literally speak light into Africa and blow something completely back. Now, isn't that Star Wars? Yeah, I remember a fellow, and you can read about this. His name was John G. Lake. And he was in Africa, and they had the blue bonic plague was killing thousands and thousands. And he said, I want to show you something. What religion is hidden away from people. Religion isn't a good thing, folks. You might have been raised in a religious family, but you've got to walk with Christ. Okay? And, and, and he said, let me show you what the light of God will do to this virus. He says, I want you, now he's, a, he's a, a doctor, okay, and he's with other doctors. They're studying this bubonic plague. You can read it in one of his books. I forget which one, Apostle to Africa or, or something. Anyway, he, he says, I want you to take some of the bubonic plague and put it on my palm. Everybody going, wow, we don't want to do that. We'll have to secure you and, you know, quarantine you and all that kind of stuff. He says, do it. I want to show you what you have as a Christian. Amen. And they put it on his palm and he says, Lord, and he released the glory of God right through his arm and right under the scope, all of that bubonic plague just shriveled up and died. That's the God we have in us. Now the disconnect is getting the God in us around us and operating so that we are covered a little more than we have been. Can you say amen? Aren't we supposed to be getting better and better as the days go by? Oh, what a love between the Lord and I. You know, amen. not to be caught up in the world and why the government's doing all the crazy stuff. That's exactly what Satan wants you to pay attention to because then you won't spend time with God. Then he gets people irritated and they become prophets, doom and gloomers. You better watch out or God's going to get you. And I'll smile and I'll say, thank God he already did. <laughs> you see, there's a lot of shenaggery being out there that is really not the gospel. Everyone say, how do I know the difference? Every good, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Every good and perfect gift. In whom he doesn't change, nor does he alter his dealings with his children. So, sickness from God? Of course not. 
so you can believe God to keep you well. Sickness never came until Adam fell. So you have a right to be redeemed. Scripture is in Galatians. says You are redeemed from the curse of the law. Curse being threefold. Spiritual death, sickness, and poverty. If your life is under some poverty, you can take authority over that and God can show you how to prosper. I don't know about you. I have children. Do you think I want my children on the street begging for bread? He says, I will not suffer the righteous and their children begging bread. Hello. Oh, I don't preach myself happy. Now we haven't even got into this. All right. So those two scriptures, did you get there? All right. So we're done here. Did I go all through the, uh, the, the scripture for today? Okay. And, and it's okay. And then it says, and now my head shall be lifted up Above my enemies. Say amen, everybody. All around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy. Lord, we praise you. We give you honor in the house of God or the tabernacle. And I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. In other words, when we keep the praises going, instead of trying to understand everything. Sometimes God wants you to understand. But when, when you're keeping the praises going, the water's moving. And you can't throw crap in your life. You're not keeping the water rolling. Keep it stirred up. Don't phony it. And Satan won't ever be able to play anything. You're moving in the spirit realm. You're like the wind. It moves here and it moves there. But he can't figure out what in the world you're doing. Because he's not privy to the information God gives you when you pray. I toast to you. All right. So, it says, but when you pray, it doesn't say if you pray, this is Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room, in other words, privacy. And when you have shut the door, shut everything else out, pray to your father who is in the secret place, in the, in the spirit. Now folks, people don't get taught what I'm telling you. When you start marching towards your prayer place, it could be anywhere, it doesn't matter. I have a prayer place. It's right in my living room in a, in a stiff chair that sits straight where I and Kleenex boxes meet. And I weep and I cry for you and pray. I'm asking God to heal you, guide you. Because God's my responsibility. My job is to pray for you, to teach you the word, and commend you to God so God can guide your life. You see, my job is, is not to own you. My job is to bless you. And God... You are God's, not mine. Amen. Some pastors treat the congregation as if they own it. Oh, God forbid. I wouldn't want to be them. No. You are God's child. The only thing I do as a, as a pastor is, is to guide and kind of lead. But I have to do it by example, not by orders. Can you say amen? All right. Then everyone say secret place. And your father which sees you in the spirit, in the secret place, rewards you openly. You can tell people that pray and people that don't. How can you tell, Pastor Kerry? No, don't get mad at me. By how peaceful, how full of joy, and how stable their life has become. That's a man or woman of prayer. Because God's their stability and that's who they meet with. Say amen. Not things that they do or don't do. Who they meet with and allow to run their life. And then it goes on further to say Psalm 91. You know it. The whole Psalms is God's result for you. Put it in the New Testament. He says, he who dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. So if you learn to be with God a lot. God is going to stand up you and smite anybody that tries to get in your face. That, that means the devil. You know, I'm going to tell you, the devil is not, since, I, since my years ago, I'm going to tell you a story, okay? Years ago, I had a big, huge church way before my time. It was during the revivals that were breaking laws, so people would just one day wake up and hundreds of people would start coming 
You were there. You saw that. Yet I was green under the years and didn't know a whole lot about things. But I was on the edge of all the prayers of people years and years ahead had prayed for revival. You see. And so we got, I got in like a surfer on the wave. And so, but it wasn't until I learned to stop riding the wave of blessings and get with God that I learned that all the blessings of God and stability and the strength that we need comes from my time or your time with God. Doesn't come from just reading the Bible. Doesn't come from just praising and worshiping the Lord. It comes only in the secret place where God can take what you know and amplify it and show you things. Where God can speak to you about your life. What you should work on, what you shouldn't. Remembering always that God never leaves you alone to work on your life. He works with you. Working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Can you say amen? God in you working it out. So, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. A couple of points to give you. Number one, God rewards those who diligently seek him. And our spiritual prayer muscles when we seek him are being exercised. Hello, what used to get to you last year won't bother you this year. But the things that you practiced last year won't work as well as this year unless it be the principles of God. Say, oh me. <laughs> it's the truth. Some of us are living our Christianity the way we used to act a year ago or maybe even farther back because everything was working. But folks, this is a new time, new age. It's the things that we know about God that we know that we know that we know about God is working and bringing us stability. We step from one reality, physical, into the realm of the Spirit by coming to the Father in the name of Jesus. So when you say Father, and you're sincere, Father in Jesus' name, you moved right into the Spirit. You're no longer in the physical. Here's the neat thing. Satan, immediately, you disappear from his eyes. You suddenly got cloaked. Boom. Now, you can't see any of this. But you believe this because God said that this is what happens. Whether you see it or not, it's not by your eyes or your ears. It's by your faith in what God said. He says, if you come to me in my, my son's name, I will envelop you in my spirit and lift you up before my throne. Now, God threw Satan out of the throne room, didn't he? Out of heaven. So guess what? He lost you when you pray. That's why you, you don't pray always a lot because your mind's too busy. I just haven't got time to pray. Have you ever heard people say stuff like that? And immediately their lives is just trash. Because it's the essence of God's life in us that sustains us. It's the light that shines out of us that you and I and the natural man can't see. But the enemy can see it. Because in that illuminous light is the nature, the power, the dominion, the very glorious power of God in that light. And God's word brings light. So when you learn to meet with God and when you speak, get your flashlight out. Your beamer knows where my hands are. And start speaking light into the darkness. Don't talk about things. Talk to them. Mountain be removed. Plant can be plucked up. Problem you better move now or I'm sick and God on you. Hello? Do we talk like that? We're starting to. Because it isn't something that you're doing. It's something that God has made you. I love that. Psalms 15, please. Verses 1 and 2, if you'll go there. It says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? What's a tabernacle? In the New Testament is a church. 
And it says, look, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Now, here's another one that a lot of Christians don't understand. God always uses the term mountain or hill to show that his lofty power is in control. Okay? So it says that we have not come to Mount Zion, but we have come to Mount, or excuse me, we have not come to Mount Sinai, but we have come to Mount Zion, where all the angels and all the praises and Almighty God dwells. So it's not really a mountain as per se, it's in the realm of authority mountain in the spirit. Can you say amen? God is high and lifted up above everything. So he describes mountains. Who will descend to the hill of the Lord? See, that's the mountain. Who will come into the presence of God is what he's saying. Who will come into the presence of God? Who will come to the holy hill? Listen. Who will dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly, righteous, we walk with God. Works righteousness, you do righteous things to help people. Amen. This is not righteous. This for you just laugh at me, Sherry. I'll get even. That sound like, does that sound like righteousness? I'll get even. They did this to me and I'm going to do that to them. That's the Old Testament. Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. In the New Testament, your job is to sit God on them. Amen. That's what turning the other cheek's all about. It's not turning the other cheek so we can punch you in the other cheek. It's turning the other cheek so that Almighty God can step in for you. And yet you can release them and punch their lights out. See, Jesus also is our weapon. David, through the rock, we speak the word. Now the key is Satan knows this. And he knows it will work. God will honor your words. So he tries to knock you out of sorts. Keep you discouraged. Get you to look at everything else. Sound familiar? So here's what we're going to cover. Do you like that? I haven't even got to my cover notes. So we're going to cover these four areas. Everyone take a breath. These are bits of, of prayer wisdom. So number one, we're going to cover understanding stacking power of prayer. The stacking power of prayer. Number two, the prayer of agreement. How powerful it actually is. Number three, the prayer of faith. What it does and how it acts. And number four, the prayer of renunciation. To renounce something. Now folks, people, Christians, some of us have, been, have dealt with the occult. Or things that we should have when we were younger. Sometimes, not always, there are spirits that follow you right into your Christianity. I remember a person that I cared about. And I love dearly. But who was to know that this person had seven devils in them? And we were in a prayer meeting and we're just enjoying the Lord. And suddenly that person's head turned, eyes rolled back, and voices started to come out. About the time, this is a joke. The Jehovah Witnesses run that way and the Mormons flee that way. And it's you, the Christian, who knows God that will take care of that. You see, Jesus never chased the devil. He always dealt with him so it seems to get in the way. Never chase the enemy. Never comment about what he's doing if you can keep it low. But speak the word and blow him out of the way. Say amen. No weapon formed against me will prosper. No thing that the enemy does will hurt my family nor cause my family any harm in Jesus' name. Lord, and I just, you just can be so creative. The problem is you can't even pray over your meal. You know what that's like for a pastor to watch people and say, would you pray over the meal? Oh, not me. Have somebody else do it. How are they existing as a Christian? Still on mama's prayers, I think. Moving right along. I meddled a little bit there. We should not be nervous about praying at all. We're meeting with our God. And as clumsy as we are, God loves it. When's the last time you threw your little baby out 
because it spit up on you. Yesterday. See, he's trying to be Terry. It's not working. It's okay, Terry. We've received that. You see, you follow what I'm saying? So God, doesn't matter how clumsy you are, he wants you to be with him. And he will help you through that. So get past the religion that I have to say it just right. That I have to do it just right. If I don't do this and if I don't do that, I won't get this. That is a work, not faith. You're in a calisthenic work. And it's okay if it's done in faith, but most people don't do it. They're just doing a calisthenic. Listen, you can have devotion without the emotion. You can be devoted to something and really not have your heart in it. Hello? God wants your heart, our heart, to be involved in God. Say amen. So let's look at it. this. First one is the stacking power of prayer. I love this. Understanding the stacking power of prayer. We call it a prayer engine. Something maybe you, you haven't heard. It's a prayer engine. How many know that you've got more than one horse underneath that car? Amen. Some people, you know, it's a 427. And the other one say, it's a 318. And then all these words for how much power is underneath the hood. Can you say amen? Prayer is power. You're bringing God in on the scene. So if you get several people praying for the same thing, it, you're developing a prayer battery, a prayer engine. So, the idea is to get you and corral you into unity. So, imagine a hose. People, the fire department shows up to a fire, Terry, and they got a little garden hose. <laughs> You're the garden hose. But if I get Peggy and these two Sherry's and David, now the garden hose is widened in the nozzle and the volume of God's power can flow out. A prayer engine, a prayer battery. Here's another thing. I'm just going to talk to you for a minute. If I take Peggy and Terry and BJ and I pray Five minutes for those three. See, there's four of us. Me, Terry, Peggy, okay? Who else did I say? And BJ, okay? I'm praying five minutes for each one of you every day. And you go, wow, that's good. That means that you're getting five, 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 five. You're getting four times five, 20 minutes of prayer on you, five minutes from different people. Prayer battery. It's building the volume of the power of God like a reservoir. Prayer battery. Prayer engine. So you're going to hear, see me coming through and on my message and this stuff for you to begin to start praying. Now all of us, let's say we run in a certain amount in our church. Say 10 of us only pray 2 minutes for those 10. That means you don't pray for yourself but you pray for the other 10. So there's 11 of you. You pray two minutes. So 10 times 2 is? So all those 11 people, through all the 11 people praying, get 20 minutes of prayer. What happens is you're only investing two minutes, but you're getting 20 minutes of repeat. And then you go to another person, you invest two minutes, two minutes. Now, I'm just breaking it down for you as a formula. Um, some people would call that a pyramid, but I call it stacking power of prayer. Very powerful. But Chris, this devil's got Christians that can't even agree. Can't even go over to one another's house without getting in competition and comparing the size of their congregations. How stupid, 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 stupid. We should be uniting and building a prayer battery. Prayer engines. So when there's a big project, somebody dying of cancer or something, we can release the volume of it. Do you understand? I hope so. I think I got that over on you really good. So God wants us to have prayer batteries. So I would suggest to you, we have right now a small congregation. Take the time out to pray for each person, their families. 
I know some of you do. Their children, their grandchildren, and for some of us, great-grandchildren. Father, for example, I'll use Peggy. Father, I pray for Peggy right now in Jesus' name. Cover her with the blood. Fill her with the Spirit. Lord, she's had some situations like a broken elevator, some, some physical things. I want you to begin to work on her about that. Lord, thank you for blessing every one of her children there, coming closer to God. See, and see Father Tom, I, I pray for the basic, what do I call the basic um, skeleton around that person. I spent at least two minutes. Then I move on to Terry and his wife, Susan. And I say, thank you, Lord, for Terry. You're making Terry into an innocent child again. He doesn't have to perform or have to try to make people like him. And so I'll just pray whatever the Spirit puts on my heart. Now, I'm not saying that's the case. You know. So, And you pray. Next thing you know, we only have so many people in our congregation. Man, you get so blessed because you're investing in the prayer engine. And if you can get the people to do the same. If I could talk you into doing the same, do you know how blessed we would be? You know, I'm just going to say this, make you think. I hope you spend time in prayer for Linda and I. Because we're, we're like the person sitting in the front. We're going to get hit first. You understand? So you pray for your leaders. You pray for those. And we pray for you. Say, I got it. So that's a prayer engine, a prayer battery. Smith Wigglesworth was asked the question, what's the secret of your power? He says, prayer, son. He always confronted the people that didn't use their brain. He said, what do you mean? He said, let me show you. And he took him out of this house, old beat up house, walked him around. And there was a basement where the, remember the stairs would go down outside into the basement? And they would have the windows that would go and then down like that. He says, he walked in the basement, opened the door, and there's 30 people praying. He says, I have 30 people coming throughout the day praying as a prayer battery for the work of God to carry on. It'd be great to see some of you before the service starts to hold hands and have a little prayer meeting up here for the people that are coming and the people that are going to be one to Jesus. Hello? Or are we too busy trying to tell everybody what we know? I don't care who you know. I don't care what you know. If you can't show me the love of God in your dedication to what he wants done. Then I know you love God. You can say, Lord, Lord, but not do the things that he says. Let's not be that way. Poke your neighbor and say, Amen! Are you with me? So the stacking power of God. Look at Romans 1, 9 and Colossians 4, 12. So I'm going to have to speed on here. I'm meddling too much. For God is my witness, it says, whom I serve with all my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer. Prayer battery. Prayer engine. See, people that start works, they know to pray for those works. You don't lead somebody to the Lord and then leave them alone. You continue to pray for them. I'll meet you next week at church right at the front door. I'll have a donut or something for you. You don't make people feel welcome. Hello? Why weren't you at church? Moving right along. Colossians 4.12. This is a woman that was one of the intercessors for Paul. Traveled in teams praying for him. And it says, Ephraim, who is one of your bondservants of Christ, greets you, always laboring fully, fervently, excuse me, I got the hiccups, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect, complete, in all the will of God. So this is what Linda and I do for you. This is not a brag, and I'm not trying to make myself holy. I do that for you because... Believe it or not, I'm sort of responsible of making sure that I do my part. My part is to teach you the word as best as I can, commend you to God and to pray for you. If I do my job, woohoo, my homework's done. And I just love my time with God in the morning, meeting with him and the Kleenex box. A bird gets up, sees and hears me weeping and 
crying. And a lot of times my tears are not out of sadness. I'm just happy things are coming together for people. I'll weep. I'll think, and I'll just be walking to my chair and Spirit of God come down on top of me and I just start weeping. Well, that's the softness of God's presence. Amen. All right. He taught, Jesus taught his disciples, his students, to do the same thing that Jesus did. And that was to seek his Father. Jesus always was praying with his Father. They were, disciples were always trying to find out where Jesus went. Remember, they'd locate him and he was praying. They'd find him in the mountain, he was praying. He'd be down by the valley, he's praying. Hello, he was meeting with his father to get instructions. That's why I see my father do, that do I. What I hear my father say, that I do. You know, say it. You see, here's wisdom. If I pray for five people, each person five minutes. Five times five is 25 minutes in prayer. If all five do the same, praying for the other five, they would have spent 25 minutes in prayer. So each person a day is prayed for five times by five different people. Only five minutes, that person is covered and the results is phenomenal. So Satan says, oh, we got to stop that. We've got to stop that. So, God, so, you, you've stopped praying and now you're running around telling people about Jesus. Don't stop praying. That's your engine. So when you get up and share about Jesus, you've got some power to back it up. But we'll run out and think we're doing things for God and you're running out of gas. If you don't know what the will of the Lord is, how can you tell anybody? So, you have one thing to share while you're young. Tell them about what Jesus is doing in your life. Just tell them. One time I went to a place up in Enumclaw. It was called, uh, oh gosh, I, maybe I'm not supposed to mention the name. Uh, the Lee Hotel. And in it was a, a beat up dive bar. And I just came back from a full gospel ministry fellowship. In, in, in Lake Wilderness. We just came back from a convention. I was so filled with the Spirit. And you know, when I'm filled with the Spirit, God can speak and I hear Him clearly. And He says, Son, I want you to go into the Lee. The Lee. Of course, I, I thought, man, that's the pit. That's not only a dive, but the dive dived, you know. So I said, are you sure? And He says, I could just feel God. Now remember, this is me, not you. Don't run around thinking that God's going to be leading you. If you have an alcohol problem, he's not going to lead you into a bar. Hello? If you have a problem with marijuana, and, you know, whatever, you know, God's not going to meet you in a marijuana shop. You know, you see what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm wondering, Lord. He says, I want you to go in there and just sit down and order a Coke. So I went and sat down. Two people there, the bartender... And this guy down the end of the, the bar, you know, there's a big, they have a counter or whatever it is. And so I'm in there and, and the bartender says, what, what can I get you? I got a Coke. And he says, I just came to kind of let you know my life is going good. Oh yeah. Of course, bartender's supposed to be an ear, you know. So I just started telling him from my socks to my underwear, to my very life, the very cars that I drive, God provided them and he cares so much about me. He takes care of my needs sometimes even before I ask. And I was just going on just my testimony of what God was doing in my life. Listen. And the power of God dropped in there. The guy was sitting down at the end of the bar, went into the bathroom. And you could hear him going, <laughs> not loud from the mouth, but like he was crashing into things. I thought, oh, more. I'm going to have to pick up a drunk or something. You know, God forgive me for saying that. Because I used to be a person that drank a lot. And uh, I would, you would never ever call me a drunk. I'd punch your lights out. And yet I was. So I'm in there a long time ago. Quite a long time ago. And I shared my testimony. And the guy from the bathroom came out white as a ghost. He says, and he came over and he sat next to me and he says, God met me in the bathroom. 
I'm thinking, boy, was that some? God got a hold. He had been watching the 700 Club in his little hotel above the Lee and thinking, oh God, I'm too bad for the Lord to save me. And God brings me in. I don't know any of this. So I'm sharing. He says, when I went into the bathroom, something hit me and I started shaking. And I started slipping and moving around. I heard a voice say, you need to surrender your life. And I'm going, oh God, what is this? And I said, Jesus, forgive me. So he came in and shared all of that. And I looked at the bartender and I said, would you like Jesus too? He says, I would. Just like that. So I prayed with him, let him go. And God says, you're done here. So as I got up to leave, Remember, God will never put you in a place unless there's something for him to do in you. So when I got up to leave, here comes in 30, 40 people. And, you know, get drunk and do whatever they do. But the bartender got Jesus and the, the guy that was the drinking problem was crying out to God, got Jesus. All because little me, and that's what I consider myself to be, followed God and obeyed him. Now, folks... You're not any different. God wants to use you that way too. So let's start stacking prayer. That moves us to point two. Point two is the prayer of agreement. Everyone say prayer of agreement. Take your Bible and go with me to Matthew 18, please. Folks, how many of you know today, a lot of people, it's really hard to get anyone to agree on anything. Who do you think is behind that? You know he is. Everything that he feeds on, and this will be good for you, Sherry. Everything that Satan feeds on is the anger, the mistrust. Listen to me. I've got, I've got videos of scientists telling us of who Satan is. And they haven't figured out it's Satan. But they're saying there's some kind of force in the earth that's making everything crazy and broken. We know who it is. They don't. Now, where was I? <laughs> I almost lost my train of thought. All right, let's, uh, oh, prayer of agreement. Okay, the thing I want you to realize is that when we pray, we're very powerful. The Bible says one could put a thousand to flight. Flight means they flee from you. In James, it says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, you didn't see anything in the book of James saying rebuke him, rebuke him. You didn't see him stomp around and scream and yell at him. It says draw near to God, so you get soaked in God's light and power and resist the devil. It's easy to resist the devil when you're covered in light and just turn on the flashlight. He will run in terror. But see, unless somebody paints that picture of what I just said, it's all through scripture. Clarity, clearly, you'll never believe for any of this. this. Satan has hidden this kind of teaching from you. He's hidden the gospel and gave us religion. Don't shout me down because you know I'm preaching real good. He's blinded up the minds of them that believe not or struggle with the scripture. He says that Jesus would become a rock of offense, a stone of stumbling to those that stumble at the word. But you know better. You're there with God spending time and he's exercising you. So now what we need to do is find somebody that will agree. Let's say we have somebody in our family that's sick. Peggy, would you agree with me on this prayer? One person prays, the other person agrees. And they finish both together. We agree in Jesus' name. So, Father, I come right now and pray for so-and-so. Do you agree? I agree. Father, I thank you that no weapon formed against them will prosper. Do you agree? I agree. You see, these are very private, very holy, very powerful principles I'm giving you. So, if you haven't already, find someone that can agree with you when you have serious things to pray over. Hello. Amen. We have a, a problem with the United States. So instead of railing on it, 
let's get in agreement and bring God in and change it. Amen. But no, the church is railing and we're yelling at people and we're getting up mad and everything. Satan just feeds on that. He feeds on that. Think about it. We can go way back to the beginning of Cain and Abel. Abel did it the way God presented it and, and Cain, he was listening to the devil and he did it his way and he did it out of the wrong evil motive to actually defiant towards God. And that's why it says that Cain's works were evil. It didn't say were wrong. It says they were evil. Gives us a little insight there. All right, prayer of agreement, Matthew 18, verse 19 and 20 says, Again I say unto you, if two shall agree on earth, where are you? Concerning anything that they shall ask, woo, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them to see the prayers answered. So if I get Peggy, BJ, and I get the two Sherry's, and we, we all come into, for example, if you're smart, you'll write down the prayer request. You'll give copies of it to each person. And they say, well, at this particular time, for 10 minutes, I want you to just continually pray for that situation. So now what has happened? You've taken the prayer battery and you've focused it in on a timing that we've got into agreement and now the hose is expanded into a lake. Yes. An engine. You see, God wants you to be creative. Not sit around and wonder about your life all the time. Get your eyes off yourself. It isn't about you. You got a business? Give it to God and let him run it. Follow his instructions. You got a family? Give them to God and have him show you what your part is in it. You bought a new car? Have God, give it to God and let God bless it so it continues to run. And hopefully you ask God to pick it out for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm moving right along. So prayer of agreement is really important. Can you say amen? It shall be done. Look at Deuteronomy 32, 28 and 30. Or 29 and 30 says, on that, that they were, he says, oh, that they were wise, it says, that they understood this very thing, that they will consider the latter end, how that one can put a thousand and two can put 10,000 to flight. So if I can get Peggy to agree with me, we can move 10,000 of the weight if it's just me, I can only move a thousand worth of whatever weight that is. So if I find three or four of you, here's how it multiplies. One a thousand, two ten thousand, three a hundred thousand, four a million, five ten million. You see how Satan does not want us in agreement it isn't what Carrie wants. It isn't what you want. It's us being in agreement for what God wants to use of this church. This is a mission church to make a difference in our neighborhood. What part do you play? Amen. You're very important to God. All right. One put a thousand, two, three, four, and keep on going. That's why the church is so scattered, so fragmented. Hello. And when we talk to each other, we're surface. How you doing? Good. Are you blessed? I'm blessed. Exactly. And Satan just laughs. Yeah, look at the ponies. He laughs. He's afraid that you will know one day how to release God every day. How to release his power, his dominion. That's why God saved you. Not to keep quiet and sit and think about yourself. We're not in competition. I don't care how much you know until I see how much you care. That's the way people are. They just are that way. Okay. We need to move on, Pastor Gary. We need to move on. The next point is the prayer of faith. Go with me to James chapter 5. This is a beautiful thing because this is what I call the prayer that covers everyone 
who's made mistakes, who has problems. Folks, one of the major, and this is for you that are watching on YouTube, one of the major causes of sickness is sin. Now, don't get mad at me. Well, I, I was just sick. But sin is not what we think. It's not just adultery. It's not fornication. That's, we always think sin is something ugly. Sometimes you didn't obey what God asked you to do and get a little extra rest. And because you didn't, so sometimes we've got to slow down a little bit and really listen. Because I remember one time, very young in my Christianity, God woke me up and he says, pray over your children. When do you all love this? And I, I rolled over and went back to sleep. I just didn't do it. They woke up the next morning with a creeping crud, their eyes gooing and their nose running. I could have stopped that of just obeying God. So, not to make anybody feel bad. This is not to make anybody feel bad, but I wonder how many times uh, things that we could have stopped if we would just stepped out in faith and obey God. Amen. Yeah, I mean, come on. I, I've been to meetings where the, God has changed the weather. We had a potluck and it was coming down cats and dogs. Raining cats and dogs, you know, the heavy rain. And getting whole hands and pray and ask God and he literally parted the clouds dozens and dozens of times because he cares that much for his children. All right. So, the prayer of faith. Now, listen to what it says. Knowing this, folks, not everybody's at the same spiritual level. We're all at different growth levels and different faith levels. So some people, what you think is no problem, other people struggle with. So some people get sick and they, some people break down in areas. Doesn't mean they're terrible. It means that we need to do something. So that's what this prayer is all about. To cover the person who has hardly any faith that is feeling so worthless. This is what the prayer of faith is about. All right. Is any among you suffering? Let him what? Pray. Is any of you cheerful? Let him sing psalms. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good psalm, see? Sing psalms. Make melody in your heart to the Lord. Then it says, then it says, is any among you sick? Let him call. Carry for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith. Now listen. Go ahead. Will save the sick. And the Lord will raise them up. So you can understand that. When Jesus died and rose again. He paid for your salvation didn't he? Yes. Most people don't know what salvation means. It means he prayed, paid for your salvation. Your wholeness. Your soundness of mind. Your completeness, your healing, and your strength. That's what salvation means. So if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, it should be made unto, that's okay, over here, I'm over here. It shall be made unto you salvation. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. What people do is they stop confessing with their mouth every day. I'm blessed, I'm healed, I'm blessed. We stop, stop speaking who we are in Christ and we start speaking the problems of our life. We start talking about them because they're on our heart. But Jesus hardly ever talked about a problem. You know what he did? He talked to them. So stop talking the negs. Stop doing that. Satan loves it. And we don't love him. So why feed the devil? Go ahead. Says, you're you sick. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise them up. If there be any sins, they will be forgiven. This is the prayer that when you pray over somebody, probably, not always, but probably, the reason why they're sick is because they live in a, 
not a quite a clean life. And the enemy gets in somehow. Not always, but sometimes. So this is why this prayer is. The prayer of faith shall save, heal, deliver, and make whole the sick. Prayer of faith shall save the sick, and if there be any sins. Now, who did Jesus die for? He died for our sins, didn't he? Did Jesus take our sins? Yes, he did. So when you pray the prayer of faith over them, Jesus comes out of your mouth. Huh? And Jesus is the one to forgive sin. So when you pray the prayer of faith over them, God is forgiving their sin while you're praying. So that there is anything Satan can hold against them to keep them sick. Eh? Are you with me here? You know what I'm saying? So we always cleanse ourselves every day. We always get up so that we don't get the initial blowback that the world throws on us. So Peggy calls and says, I'm not feeling well. Carrie, pray over the phone with me. All right, let me get somebody to agree. We're going to pray. Agree. Boom. The power of God's released. See? I'm supposed to tell you, Peggy, be careful what you eat, especially on Saturday night. I don't know why, but I'm supposed to tell you that. I'm supposed to tell you, Sherry, our new Sherry is what I call you in prayer, that God's going to adjust the very things that you need to be who you are. So that means teeth for some reason. I keep getting that. And uh, something that you need to have fixed that it just seems astronomical. But God says, no problem for him. Can you, is that, does that fit? Yeah, okay, good. Woo, if I remember wrong, you can tell me, you know. Because God, I try to speak God and I don't try to think what I think and speak. Okay, so, are you guys, so when you're not feeling well, what should you do? You call on God and then you ask for others to pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we won't go on too long. But it says that while they're praying for you, you're being forgiven of all your stupid stuff. So you want me praying for you. Because God is sitting and cleansing and knocking out. He's doing, what is that, whack a mo to the devil? Waka, waka, waka. So when I pray for Terry, God is whack a and all this stuff that's messing Terry's life up. And when Terry prays for me, it's the same. And when you pray for me and I pray for you, you got to understand what an engine, what an agreement. All of us praying in faith, believing, this is going to be one healthy place. So we continue to go, continue to walk on with the Lord. Now, Jesus could come in any minute, and I don't want to hold him back. But meanwhile, let's go after him. And finally, our last, the prayer of renunciation. Now, this is what, what people don't understand. You see, I did mess with Ouija boards. I was a rock and roll drummer. I, I messed with a lot of stuff I don't want to bring up because that's bringing up Fluffy. Fluffy's my wife's cat. I accidentally dug up after about four years. Fluffy didn't smell very good. And when you dig up your past life and you, your old problems from behind you, you're bringing up Fluffy and you're going to stink. So stop telling me all the problems you had yesterday. Tell me how you went with God and you gave them to him. And how he's working you through them. That's what you need to be holding on to. Come on now, I'm not preaching at you. Trying to encourage you. Don't dig up Fluffy. <laughs> Prayer renunciation. So when a bunch of us, now this is when years ago, I got saved in 77. April 20th was baptized. So after a few months, we were taught that we shouldn't be messing with anything unclean. So we brought our rock and roll records and tapes and Ouija boards and games that were all satanic worship. And we all put them in a burn barrel, dumped gas in it and lit it on fire. You could hear the screaming in the spirit, the wrenching of these spirits coming all out of that. What were we doing? We were renunciating. We were renouncing Satan's hold on our life. And sometimes there are Christians 
that come out of some heavy things. For example, I don't preach against abortion even though I am against abortion. And I don't believe in it. It's a murder of innocent people. But there are people that I know have had abortions and now are forgiven. They have their children waiting for them. So that's why I don't preach an issue. Issues divide people up. I preach the gospel, the word, that we can unite around. Yes, I hate abortion. I hate corruption. I don't think the person that's in the office, whatever office, doesn't belong there. I think all of those things, but I don't preach them because it divides us up exactly what Satan wants. He wants us united, God does, and not divided. United we stand, divided we... There you go. Satan gets you off by yourself. Gets you a place where you're not going to church and nobody loves you. Easy pickings, you little chicken. Hello. Don't get yourself off by yourself. Always hang around the people that love God. As much as you can, fellowship. It builds strength. So, renunciation. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, finishing with you. Boy, he talks a lot. Yeah, today was a little long, but I thank you for your, your time. Actually, you don't want to go out in the blizzard anyway. Yeah. Anyway, so, so 2 Corinthians 4, look at 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have this ministry, everyone you have a ministry, to share the word. As we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We don't give up. But we have renounced. The hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, miracles, commending, commending ourselves, got the hiccups again, bless my heart, <laughs> commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. It would be like this. Back when I was a sinner, rock and roll drummer, I was involved in everything. Uh, the only thing I didn't do is stick heroin in my arm. I did just about everything else. Awful, just awful. And I do my best to, to not let that come up. But once in a while, I can bring up things that'll make you think. And some of the things that you've experienced, you can use them as a lesson, but just don't dwell on them. Can you say amen? So we had to renounce. So. If you have any, any problems, ever messed with the occult, drugs, all that, it, and some of you, I already led you in this, so that's okay. You need to say everything that's of the enemy, everything that's not of God, everything that I practice in that the enemy might use against me in my present state, I bind, rebuke, and renounce in Jesus' name. When you renounce, you're breaking its tie. You're like cutting the umbilical cord. So it doesn't wander around a dry place and seek to come back to you. Oh, remember we had such fun with the Ouija board? Hi, I told you the name of the Antichrist? <laughs> Hello. And you go, oh, I would never do that. Of course you wouldn't. But how about had your horoscope? Do you read horoscope? Terrible. That's why it's horoscope. <laughs> it's right there in front of your face, but... If we're not walking with God, we won't see it in the light. We'll see it as everybody's accepted it. Abortion's okay. Do you realize that people voted for abortion in our nation? So don't cur curse the people. They're idiots, excuse me. You don't murder innocent people. That's what Satan had Hitler do. All those Jews was his blood sacrifice to the devil. He was a Satan worshiper. That's why he was so corrupt. Folks, I just got a clip that I want to share you about. Oh man, how long are you going to keep me? As long as it takes. It's on the UFO occult connection. I'm just going to say this. Everything that's paranormal, that's in the negative, is all one person, and that's Lucifer. And many faces, UFOs, fairies, leprechauns, all these different faces to lure people away from God. It's all the same face. Skinwalker Ranch, I got a good one on Skinwalker Ranch. 
because there are some of the people that are working on the ranch to discover and to make these things public are born again spiritual Christians. I watched a guy pray in the name of Jesus and say, I've got to cover myself with the blood while I fly into the Skinwalker Ranch. And if you know anything about it, it's just a portal while well, Satan has been coming and going there for years, hundreds of years. Even the Indians will tell you stories. And you'll say, well, are there places like that? What do you think? What do you actually think? You can't run and hide from what's out there. Embrace it. These are fallen angels' buildings, hidden cities under, underneath the earth. Now, I'm not a correspondence weird person, but I want to tell you that God banished Satan to the earth to crawl on his belly, and serpents like to go in and make caves. So under a lot of our feet, there are things underneath you don't want to know. Oh yeah, Pastor Jerry, I think you're just being too weird. Folks, here's how silly we are. Where is hell under your feet? It says the hell's in the earth under your feet. All kinds of creatures in there. And all kinds of ways in which they're led out to torment human beings. And that's what the Ouija board and all those things are designed to do for you to draw evil spirits out because you don't know any better. Everyone say, no, I renounce those things. All right, last scripture I want to give you is in Acts 19, 18 through 20. And then we get to a chance to release you so, so much. Thank you for, I missed you. I kept you long because I, I love your shining faces. Amen. We've been a week since a lot of us have seen each other, hasn't it? Wow. Think about the weather, broken elevators, all kinds of other things. All right, so the Acts chapter 19. When the word of God and the light of God started coming forth, look what they did. In verse 18 it says, And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of those things and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. There was a huge revival going on. Everybody was getting rid of the devil. Folks, there's no such thing for a believer to compromise for evil and light. They don't mix. The Bible says come out from among them and be separate. And touch not the unclean thing. And then it says, then go into all the world and give them the gospel. If you got something out of this morning, would you give the Lord? Amen. <laughs>